about talking a little nerdy about typography and how it can influence your style with someone I followed for a long time, John Hendricks. Now, John, do you feel like typography has really influenced your work or is that me just like blurting it out and saying, you'd be great for this. What do you think? <laughs> yes. Well, glad to chat. Type. Um, yeah, type and lettering are a big part of my work and I, I'm kind of an accidental hand letterer in a way. I, I went to undergrad for illustration, but I took some design courses and eventually finished a, a track in design because I just loved type as image. I, I love type typographic objects. And you can see in my work, they become sort of images that in, inhabit my spaces just as much as any other picture would. There are a lot of people putting typography in their work, but I really wanted to talk to you because you really marry the two in a lot of different ways. So, um, but I do want to talk first about how you started as an illustration major and then went to graphic design because I was an illustration major and all the graphic design majors like totally dreaded typography class. And then by the end of it, they loved it. Did you have yeah. that experience too? Yeah, I teach at Washington University in St. Louis and we teach all of our illustrators type. They all take type one and two. And of course the designers take that as well. And yes, I think early classes in type can often feel like learning algebra or times tables or something. And, and if you're an artist, it, it doesn't seem to be compatible with the intuitive making of, of painting or, or illustration. But if you see typography and illustration as an act of design, which they are, they're, I mean, many of the illustrators working today are what I call design illustrators. They're, they're, they're people that are inhabiting the space between pure picture making and, and pure design. And in fact, design as a discipline really should be invisible. It's supposed to serve the content. And if you see the design, you're actually getting in the way of the function of that of that work. So in fact, but now most design doesn't function that way. Most design is meant to be kind of noisy and, and you're supposed to see the designer a little bit. So in many ways, illustrators thinking of themselves as designers, um, I think makes the work clearer. And, and it's actually a, a a, a simpler way to draw, I think, when you think about edges, shapes, forms, and of course, uh, letters. Term design illustrators. Yeah. Although yeah, right. I kind of want to put the yeah. illu first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you say ill designers, it doesn't work as well. So design yeah. illustrators just reads better. But yeah, you're right. You've thought about this. I trust you. Uh, I have one of your books here. Uh, I have a couple of them. But when I was flipping through, I was looking at um, well, first of all, how to describe like how I was saying, like using type to illustrate what you're saying, uh, yeah. combining type to kind of give different flair or meaning to words. But as I flipped through, I felt like I could see like some, I wish I would have marked everything, but some pages read more like a children's book illustration where you have the picture and the words and then some some work more like an infographic uh where you have you're like okay i need to break this down and i will break it down visually in this way and on other spreads it reads like you know a novel where you have a lot of type how do you decide what to do <laughs> and, and like do you how do you approach like each part of a book? Cause this is, you wrote this and it's like kind of massive. That, that was a four year project. Um, so yes, it took a long time and everyone imagines that the pro there's a sort of secret to the process or there's tips where you can do it. The truth is that even as professionals, it's extremely messy. Uh, I mean, and someone asked Bob Dylan, did you write the words of the lyrics to all along the watchtower first? And he said, yes, like, you know, the, yes, that you do them at the same time. So I that book reflects the way I learn, which is a collision of words, images, informational graphics, narrative, type. Like so, it's like the way I have described that book is one hundred percent words and one hundred percent pictures. So there is a there is a blending of those communication spaces 
that actually creates something that neither the words nor the images can do alone. And that's kind of the magic of illustration is that third space that is created between words and pictures. And so that book and, and a, a future book I'm working on right now about the friendship between C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien is using that similar form because I, I just like to learn things that way. And and then you have other books that read more like graphic novels where we have scenes and and boxes like the the Holy Ghost one, right? Yeah, or you know that the Holy Ghost book is more of classic comics, you know, um, almost like gag cartoons or or funny page comics. And you know, and also I do traditional picture books, which um, you know have the have the kind of classic text page turn relationship. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even in that one, actually, I'm starting, you can see that's yeah. my first book I wrote and illustrated. And you can see I'm I'm even at that stage trying to blend those spaces of type and image together. And I still haven't totally figured out how it works best. But yeah, and, and you, you have to think about to the audience, you know, the uh, a picture book audience is different from a middle grade graphic novel, which is different from a, a, a YA chapter book. So every every audience requires a different kind of uh, turning of the dial to make sure that you're reaching them. It seems like uh, your priority is in breaking things down and communicating it ultimately, whichever, however it needs to be done. Yeah, I, th I think actually all of design and illustration is, is a design activity is about clarity and hierarchy. So, you know, one thing that differentiates illustration from gallery art or fine art is that we really care what our audience understands about our work, right? It's, it's kind of the highest thing about illustration is that there is a desired communication um, to that audience. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be obvious or blatant or didactic, but there is a particular goal that you want your work to achieve. Uh, and, and for some uh, art, you know, a, a Cornell painting or, or, or a Monet, um, those are vague. Maybe the goals are are not as explicit, right? And and that's that's what fine art or gallery art does better than illustration. But for illustration, yes, I, I have a very clear message. I have a clear goal, and I want to make sure that the work really satisfies that, and so that the reader is cared for, that they're understood, that I'm thinking about what they are getting out of the book, and and so if they don't if they don't get what I'm intending, then the book is not a success. So, you know, like art can't fail, but design can fail. And that, mm -hmm. and that's a big difference to think about when you're making something versus when you're designing something. That sounds like a lot of pressure, but you like that challenge. Yeah. You know, actually, I, I, I think, honestly, I think it's easier when you have a clear goal. Um, it just means that there are some guardrails, there's some limitations, there's some things that you can set in place and then work inside of those parameters. So I think that's why I'm an illustrator and not a sculptor, for instance. I got a sense of those parameters by the three color limitation you had on this. Is this literally printed in three colors that or do you just actually, make it look that way? No, that one is actually printed in three, in two Pantones and black. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted that approach. There's a conceptual, obviously, uh, approach to it. You know, the story of Hitler and the Third Reich is in that red color. Dietrich's is, is in that teal color. And then as their stories overlap, the colors overlap and overprint and begin to vibrate because they're very, they're, they're strange colors together. And it's intentionally designed to be sort of off-putting. Uh, and of course, kids have immediately said, oh, I should read these with 3D glasses, right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> It's a hilarious effect, though not designed that way. But but honestly, that is the the vibrating and the unsettling is something that I really uh, wanted to feel. Yeah, trying to find a place where those two colors overlap each other. Yeah, it's neat because you get that third kind of brown uh, oxblood color, and that that's something that I could have I could have sort of faked with CMYK printing. Um, mm -hmm. But man, you really can't get that red and that teal without that Pantone color. So it took some. Mm -hmm extra work to build the separations into the, the art files, but it was worth it. So this series where I'm talking with artists, we're talking about style. Um, and you have a distinct style, whether you use, you know, words or not, that's obviously part of it. Have you ever sat down and thought about your style? Like, have you ever had to describe it? Do you talk about it? Or are you just like, 
that's what I do, and it just comes out this way. I, I wish I could could claim that I was just very bohemian about the way I approached my art and was like, oh, man, I just made the things I made and this is what it is. But no, I was very much in my head as a young artist, especially in college, thinking about the S word, the style, you know, like the what is my style going to be? And, and I, I think using for me, I have found in teaching the word voice is a little easier to understand and because voice can mean a lot of different mediums because I change mediums all the time but the way that I make stuff is actually doesn't change and so I think if you are thinking about your stylistic approach what is the signature of your work going to be it's actually not something that you need to choose or invent my belief is that it is inside a collection of all the things you've loved growing up, all the media you watch, all the things you enjoy drawing, that voice is yours and can't be duplicated. So you really just have to dig it up. And But unfortunately, it takes digging about 10,000 holes before hmm. you can find it. So it it is not something you can think your way into. You have to make your way into that voice. And so the more you make, the more you can center enjoyment in making, the easier it will be. Because of course, when we enjoy our work, it gets better and we long to do it more. So enjoying your process is not just like, um, you know, be happy. You know, it's not just follow your bliss. It is truly the only way you can sustain 10,000 hours of drawing to find that voice is to enjoy it, enjoy the process, not just the result because I have seen so many artists who are obsessed with the result and actually hate the time that it takes to get to the result. And they're not going to continue making because who wants to spend all that time? 99.99% of your time as an artist is in the making, not in the finishing. So enjoying process is the, is the quickest way to finding your voice, but it's still going to take an investment of time, energy, and passion. For sure. Have you had moments where you needed to kind of start over again or oh yeah feeling you know like it doesn't just flow for like ever as long as you create right there's a tension of course yeah and and i think this desire to have a world without friction we see it everywhere like we want our uber eats we want uh you know we we want to be able to glide through the world in this sort of optimized life and that is not how art is made. And you, if you are if you are using friction or or pain in art making as a guide, like to say, well, that was difficult, so therefore I shouldn't do it, or that's proof that that idea is not good, that mm -hmm. you're never going to get anywhere. You must go through things that you struggle with because that that's really what learning is. Um, but man, it's very hard. I, 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 my style was very different. The way I made work in college was very different. The way I made work in graduate school was very different because I was looking for something that I enjoyed. I couldn't have articulated it that way, but I was. I was looking for a thing that I most made when no one else asked me to make anything. What was the stuff I sat down and did? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for I've had some students that are like, well, they want to paint because they're, they want to be really great, you know, draftsmen and, and renderers. But the things that they like to do were like little sculpty, you know, sculptures and stuff and, and collages. And like, man, if you sit down and want to make that stuff, I, I would listen to that. I would do more of that thing. That's probably closer to the thread you need to pull on that sweater to find your voice than like, you know, things that you think are proper or or God forbid, marketable like that, that you should never chase that as an idea that will that will send you into a, a pit very quickly. Mm hmm. I've been there and back for sure. Uh, but you like to work by hand, which I think is interesting because do you feel, I mean, we can often feel pressure to get more and more digital or this way is easier, more marketable or easier for um, it to hand off. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've found ways to make it work, but how do you handle that tension where you're, do you feel pressure to work more digitally? I mean, I all my work ends up digitally. I mean, I've colored all my work on a Wacom and Photoshop. So like mm -hmm. I color lots of my work digitally. I just enjoy the process of drawing so much better on a sheet of paper than I do on a screen. Uh, some of it is just sustainability. Like my shoulder hurts drawing on a tablet or on a screen. 
Um, but there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, again, it's a tool. These are all tools. So I, the thing I want to spend my time on is marks on paper. That's what I love. That is the thing that makes me excited about drawing and making. Um, now, there, of course, is a bonus in that, like, when you make an artifact, you can also sell that artifact on top of the usage itself. So, like, if you're making comics, I've heard a lot of people say the only way to make car comics sustainable is to make handmade art because you can sell that art for three times the amount that you actually got on the page itself, um, especially like uh, uh, more uh, IP comics. But all, all that said, the, the tools are the ways that you make the work, whether that's Procreate or Photoshop. If, if you get great enjoyment out of that, if that is the way that allows the work to be authentic and that you long to make it again, that's, that is awesome. And something I also noticed, I think as a good um, final thought is you're kind of like always drawing. You have your church sketches, yep. <laughs> you have your work. Uh, that's part of the secret sauce. Am I right? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm drawing because in many ways, like I cannot pay attention if I'm, if I'm just, staring at someone talking and it's it's a it's a flaw of my own mind that i'm just so much better if my hand is doing something while i'm listening now of course it gives the signal that i'm not listening but but the truth is i i i need drawing to <laughs> be my best self in meetings in some ways like and of course i enjoy it of course i love in church listening to the sermon and and the game of trying to make that work inside of a drawing the sort of randomness of it Again, these are all kind of ways that I have learned to enjoy my craft. And so, yeah, I and there's plenty of drawings that just I don't like and they don't work and no one ever sees them. Um, I, I post drawings for my sketchbook and like it looks like everything I do is just perfect and always works. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of being selective like that. So it's not very fair. But <laughs> the idea that you're using drawing as a, a way of thinking, I think that is one thing I think people should take away. Drawing is not an outcome is not making an image or a result. Drawing is visualized thinking. And if you can just make an extension of your mind, the making, um, it, it becomes this like third language you can use. So I, that that's kind of what I try to teach to my students is make it part of your part of your daily process. You have a lot of awesome visualized thinking out in the world. So we need to direct people to your website. That's John Hendricks with an X. And you're you just wrapped up at least the the hand drawn part of what's coming next. So we got to stay tuned. And what is that? You referred to it already. Yes, it's called uh, Myth Makers. It is a uh, long graphic novel hybrid storytelling format, kind of like Faithful Spy, about C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, who were best friends and basically accidentally reinvented literature in the middle of the 20th century um, through their, their friendship and their fellowship. So it's a story about them, but it's really using them as a lens to talk about where do myths come from? Where do fairy tales come from? And uh, it's, it's really a, an exciting, it's a passion project. I've been working on it for five years and I, I, it'll be out next fall, fall 24. Awesome. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Okay. Thanks a lot. Are you ready to try on some type and bring it into your artwork? Let's do it together in Watercolor Bold. Try it for a full week for free.